Welcome to Macro Musings, where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the most important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I am your host, David Beckworth, a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University, and I'm glad you decided to join us. Our guest today is Lars Christensen. Lars is a former guest of the show, a founding member of the Market Monitor's Tradition, and now an entrepreneur in the AI space. Lars joins us today to discuss AI and implications for the economy and for monetary policy. Lars, welcome back to the show. Thank you, David. Great to be back. Well, it's great to have you on. We were talking on Twitter, now known as X. I prefer to call it Twitter, so I'll use Twitter. We were talking on Twitter about some of the activities you've been doing with AI. And so I want to talk about that later. But you also are an entrepreneur of sorts in AI. You've got your own business. In fact, you're you're moving, as I understand, from a lot of your focus being on macro work to AI. So maybe tell us the story, how you are transitioning towards more of an AI focus. Yeah, well, you know, I've, I've been an economist now for, for nearly 30 years. And you know, the the entire period as a macroeconomist, first in government, then later in the banking sector and, 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 and running my old consultancy later on and, and doing academic work has been about standing outside the economy and watching the economy. But there has been this common denominator that data has played a, you know, significant role in that. We both, of course, come from that market monetary tradition, that markets are important, that the markets are telling us stories. And financial markets are interesting because that's really the best reflection of expectations about the future. But I'm seeing development where everything is becoming financial markets. That with the development in, you know, I think essentially see it as three parts. First of all, we've had 35 years of the internet or more. Yes, it is enormous amounts of data that we all have access to. At the same time, you know, the computing power has gone up dramatically and the price of that has gone down dramatically. And the third factor is that we now can, you know, handle that with machine learning, with large language models. And when we get that, we essentially have a situation where all markets begin to behave as financial markets, that the prices become a lot less sticky. If you talk to business people, they now have access to data that only economists used to have access to. So they can make decisions that resembles the economic textbook a lot more. They probably did that historically, but now they actually have the data and the, the tools to, to, to do this. And so what have happened to me is that when I resigned from my banking job back in 2015 to start Markets and Money Advisory, my, my, my economic and financial advisory, I, I had an ambition of not only doing the finance stuff, I also wanted to do more academic stuff. I've been doing that. But I was also interested in sports economics, sports analytics. I've been doing advisory on, on this side, so to speak, on that. And had a whole you know, a fascination on that. And if you look at sports data, and particularly in the US, of course, sports data has now been completely common. You don't, have, you don't see an NBA team making decisions that are very different from what a bank would do. You know, capital asset pricing model can explain how many three-point shots and two-point shots, you know, any given NBA team would take. So I like that fascination of using the data and the data that's available. So what have happened is with, when we got ChatGPT out one and a half years ago, I started using it immediately to begin with just for the fun of it, but also to do Python coding. And I remember the first day I was playing around with 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 exactly that. I thought, okay, I want to estimate, I want to get ChatGPT to write a code that creates a linear regression on the US stock market, explained by different macroeconomic factors. And I, I asked ChatGPT to write the code, and it wrote the code in, in a few seconds. And I, I, I took the code and popped it into Python. And I was rather, you know, saddened by the fact that it came out showing errors. And I thought, okay, I'm not trying to code anything so myself. I was just going iterations. And suddenly, after seven, eight hours working on it, you know, it worked. 
there was a there was a nice graph on my screen and my model was there and it was working and I'm thinking, my God, this took me eight hours. I it, using other tools, I could have done it in fifteen minutes. But I also knew that something fundamental had happened. So I started using it much more. And as ChatGPT was improving, suddenly it was you know leading me to having very significant productivity gains in terms of doing data analysis, econometrics, and I started to write about it and started using it. And when I had presentations for clients, pension funds, and so forth, they would say to me, Lars, that graph, that's not macro burn. That's not that. That's what is that? Well, that's ChatGPT, or rather it's Python through ChatGPT. And it was like, can you teach us that? And so I ended up being dragged in doing workshops with pension funds or stuff like that, talking about ChatGPT and doing data analysis from that perspective. And suddenly, you know, everybody was talking about it. And now I find myself being dragged into the AI revolution because I'm not an IT guy, but I do understand economics and I do understand data. I worked with it. And obviously where AI can make a real difference is in finance, in banking. It's also in health. But of course, with my finance background, it's very natural that 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 I'm that. So I have... I have set up an AI advisory company uh, called uh, Pace, P-A-I-C-E, with a partner, Christian Heiner Smith, he in Copenhagen. And we advise his, you know, primarily financial companies, but also other retail companies on, you know, how do you use data to make decisions? You know, what kind of AI tools could be beneficial? It, it sounds like a bit of a transition, but to me, it's just the world that has changed. And... I'm using my skills as somebody who's used to work with data, to work with data on a more micro level. That doesn't mean that I'm not interested in macroeconomics. I do macroeconomics every single day and I still advise on that. But it's just the world is changing. And you can say that in many ways, it feels like we're moving towards this, you know, it, it seems like a little bit of a real business cycle model environment that we are moving to. And AI yeah. is probably, and we can talk about that, is making price is a lot more flexible, or at least have the potential to do that. So you are riding the AI wave up top. You're not waiting to be pulled along painfully or grudgingly. You're a surfer who's staying ahead of the wave, so to speak, the AI wave, which is fun and interesting to see. And, and there's a lot to unpack what you just said there. Let's, let's first move to the point you made about flexible pricing. So you have a post that you wrote titled From Merchants to Quants, The Digital Revolution in Retail. And, and you get into dynamic pricing. And maybe maybe explain to us what is dynamic pricing and what are some of the big implications? I mean, how, how will it further connect the world and markets? Dynamic pricing is essentially what we have in our textbooks. It's flexible prices. It's prices reacting to supply and demand. But what, of course, we see in the real world is that menu cost. It takes, there is a cost of changing a price, and therefore you don't change it all the time. However, there are periods where there are higher demand, there are supply side problems, and so forth. Markets should react to that, and prices should change. But there is also some aversion towards price changes. We have known the discussion in, in the US over dynamic pricing or surge prices at Wendy's. That, of course, have highlighted that discussion. But fundamentally, the reason that prices in the supermarket is not changing in the same way as stock prices are changing is that that cost of changing that. And so if you walk into a supermarket in, in, in the U.S., in most supermarkets, the, the, there will be a paper or cardboard price tag. And somebody will come around changing it from time to time. Probably relatively frequent, but not a lot, two or three times a day. However, if you go into a Scandinavian supermarket, you would see that, I would guess that half of, of all supermarkets in Denmark or Sweden have electronic price tags. So the major supermarkets in Denmark essentially are able to change the prices from their headquarters so they can change it whenever they want, and the cost of changing that is very low. This is like a gas station in America. Then you go to gas stations, you got digital prices, they're changing all the time. It's just taking that gas pricing model into the retail, into the grocery store. Exactly. And that that that's a very natural thing as the cost of the whole electronic thing has gone down dramatically. And at the same time, the the cost of labor has gone up. So it's a very natural thing that that we we're seeing this. So 
This is essentially the same transition we saw in finance 40 years ago, 35 years ago, when we went from open outcry in, in you know, trading or trading floors. You know, when I started mm. working on a trading floor in the early 2000s, it was a very noisy place to be. I loved the atmosphere of that. When I resigned from Danske Bank, where I worked for 15 years in 2015, I was still on the same trading floor, but it had become extremely boring. There was no noise. There was no nothing. And a major reason for that, because most of the trading had become electronic, there was not a lot of you know dealers talking to market makers on the phone. There was not a lot of client talking. It was all, all electronic. You know, probably today, 90, 95% of all FX trading is algorithmic in some form. That doesn't mean that it's independent of human decisions. But, you know, the actual settlement of the, uh, the, the trading is algorithmic. So, you know, that's a result of technological development. And my view is that that is moving further and further to the economy. And so if you are a major supermarket, you have electronic prices. The, the only one thing is stopping you from changing that is that it's plugging in an algorithm because what they're doing is already doing that. They are tracking their competitors. What do they do? They, you know, if you talk to, you know, retailers in Denmark, for example, they will say, you know, we're tracking all our competitors. We're using apps to, you know, to to scrape their prices from their websites. And, you know, we send out spies to other shops and they all say that. And they 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 will change their prices at a rather high frequency, but they haven't plugged in the algorithms yet. But it's it's not hard to think that you have machine learning that will track all kinds of data. You know, you have seasonalities, you have, sure. you know, is there a public holiday? Is there a banking holiday? Has, has the, it's a payday? How is the weather? You know, what, how, what should the price of ice cream be? Should that be dependent on the weather? Yes, yeah, surely. It is likely to come so. And so, so in my view, we are only a few years from uh, seeing full dynamic pricing in most supermarkets in Scandinavia because the technology is there to do it. So it's just a question about who will do it first. And I have this vision of this. You know, imagine being here in Copenhagen where I'm now. I'm walking to my local supermarket while Jerome Powell have a rate announcement in the U.S. And he says, you know, forget about it, guys. You know, I said I would cut interest rates, but I'm not going to do it. You know, surprising the markets, you know, the dollar strengthens, market break even, inflation rates drop. Oil prices drop. But what happens in my supermarket? Well, the price of milk will ju drop just a little bit in my supermarket in the same way as market expectations of inflation will drop because that is how you would build the algorithm. You would tie it up with domestic factors, but obviously the Fed determines global monetary superpower. You are the guy who coined that phrase, you know, the Fed as a as a monetary superpower, a global monetary superpower. Imagine that the Fed had an instantaneous impact on milk prices in a supermarket in Copenhagen. And I don't think we're far away from that. I think we're actually quite close to that. And then that, of course, moves us to a situation where a lot larger share of prices in general will be described by being flexible. And so menu cost has just collapsed. And the price of information has gone down. So this is this is not fantasy. If you plug these things into an economic model, this is what the economic model would say. And the future is here. So that's why you were alluding to a real business cycle model, which is truly a flexible price model, no nominal rigidities, exactly. no sticky prices. And you know, it, it's kind of, I don't know, troubling is too strong a word, but a little unsettling to think that Jay Powell's statements might affect the price of my ice cream or my milk when I, I go to the grocery store, which means, Lars, that not only will people like you and me be watching FOMC announcements, announcements and press conferences, a lot more people will be tuned into Jay Powell's press conference before they buy their groceries. Yeah, and you will get a lot more listeners on your podcast because suddenly it becomes very, very clear that the price of milk is determined by Jerome Powell, or at least the basket you buy is is driven by that. You know, we both agree on that inflation yeah. is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. Now it will become much more clear to everybody. Yeah, so that that is pretty, uh, I don't know, sobering to think through all the implications that the, the Fed's 
reach is going to be even more acutely felt in many places around the world because of dynamic pricing. Yeah, and I, I believe that, that that is happening. So one more point, Lars, on dynamic pricing. So it it's, it's both has great potential, maybe some transition cost to this new brave world of of dynamic pricing. Something I want to come back to later in the show, but I'll just I'll just throw it out there right now is I, I completely see your point like output prices, product prices will become more flexible. I suspect, however, like wages and some input costs may still be a little more rigid just for other reasons than menu costs. So people for a number of reasons we can come back to, but I think you can imagine a world where output product prices become flexible and wages might still be a little bit sticky. And then what would be the monetary policy implications? But let's let's come back to that in a minute. Let's go to another reason why we we're talking today, and that is some of the tweets you've had on recently. And you've demonstrated a progression of abilities on on Twitter. You showed how to do VARs with ChatGPT. And then recently, and this is what really triggered this conversation, you showed how to do, with the help of ChatGPT, the new version of it, DSGE models, which I was really surprised to see. So tell me about that experience. Well, it it actually came from the discussion about obesity. And it's, 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 it's something that has been on my mind for, for some time, the obesity problem in the U.S. and the, the economic implications of that. And I wanted to try to model Gary Baker's old rational addiction model. And I've been, that's, I wrote to ChatGPT, do you know Gary Baker's rational addiction model? Because, as you know, can we explain, can we, can we model rational addiction to calories? And if we can model that, how could medicine change that addictive, beha- addictive behavior? So I want us interested in, in modeling that and thinking about that. And so I just, you know, kind of asked ChatGPT, do you know this? And I said, you know, could you do some modeling on this? And it started to print out equations and I got the consumer and maximization behavior. I'm like, what the hell is this? And it's like, so it, it, I kind of like it worked, and you know I remember sitting around for a couple of hours, and and trying to find out what the optimal price of anti-obesity medicine would be given the parameters in Gary Baker's anti, uh, you know rational addiction model, and it's like it it happened by kind of chance, and I thought okay from then on I thought okay I wasn't totally happy about it. But then when the uh, the newest version of ChatGPT came out a couple of weeks ago, I said, you know, let me ask you to do a new Keynesian DSGE model. And I asked it, and you went actually further with it than I did, because I asked it just to give me the Python code, because I felt more, more, more comfortable to see the Python code, because I wanted to see what was happening, you know, that's smart. Yes, under the, on, on, under the hood, so to speak. Yes, and so and and that worked well. And the interesting thing I was as I was calibrating the model, the model was not converging. It was explosive in some of the shocks where the model was not stable. I was like, okay, I have to find out the parameters. But there was a lot of parameters here, and you know, I was not entirely sure what was making it unstable. So I simply cut out the picture that it has produced the graph, and just put that directly into chat GPT and say, something is wrong with the model. And, you know, it replies that, yeah, I can see it's not stable. It might be because this and this parameter is, you know, really? too much. Yeah. And so, you know, they're like, wow, that, you know, and so I, I was going back and forth and I, you know, often compare chat GPT to having a good assistant analyst. It makes the exact same mistakes as an assistant analyst, but you know it's also a, you know much better at doing econometrics than you are or I am. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and so you know you're going back and forth, and so you, you I was going iterations on this, and of course the the idea was to build, and this way it becomes a little bit meta in the sense that uh, I was trying to analyze how will the economy behave in a new Keynesian DSG model if the Fed failed to understand that natural interest rates have gone on due to a positive productivity shock. And so that was what I was doing. And I was like playing around and we were going back and forth. 
And yeah, as you've seen, it worked uh, quite well. And the interesting thing was when I had built the model, I said to it that, could you write some paragraphs on the causality in this? What t- determines what? And, you know, and it put that out. And I was then putting that together with my own prose into a blog post. So like, it, yeah, you know, it all yes. was connected. I misread your post. I thought, you know, it had done everything. So I went and ran with it and it did do everything for me. Now, my model, of course, was less precise and had a number of problems, but it was striking and quite surprising to see. I I said, look, I want to run a standard New Keynesian model. Here are the issues I want to address. Can you give me a model? And it did. And not only did it give you the model, but it would summarize the equations. It would would tell you what they were. I mean, you literally did not need to know much about DSGEs to run these things. And then I said, can you run it for me? Because it gave me the Python code. Can you run it for me in Python? I said, sure. And it sent back these impulse response functions. My jaw hit the floor. So that has been the development since I did that first stock price valuation model, you know, one and a half years ago in the early version of ChatGPT to then ChatGPT4, where I used the, the, the GPT called Data Analyst. Data Analyst can do Python stats. So... It will run it within ChatGPT, but now you don't have to go through that GPT called Data Analyst. It's just where you are, and it can run it. And I'm still not entirely certain that it's doing what it's saying it's doing, and that's why I was doing the the Python thing. And i I've, I've been you know I've been working with ChatGPT intensively for, for a long time now, and so you can see it's progressing. That okay. It couldn't do that yesterday. Now it can do that. And it's, it's just been amazing. No, I think what you're doing is, is the smart way to do it is to, to check ChatGPT, run the Python code yourself. Now, what I did, though, is so I, I ran, as I mentioned, the, the early versions of these questions I had in the models. And then I started making it more complicated. And once I, it started getting a little more complicated, like, for example, I asked ChatGPT the, the question, in what conditions would nominal GDP targeting be better than a simple Taylor rule? And would it would it help financial stability? And it brought up the accelerator model by Bernanke and Gertler and Gilchrist. But but that model started getting a little more complicated. It gave me the Dynair code. It didn't run it, but it gave me Dynair code. So exactly. So there are still limits, but still the fact that it gave me Dynair code, it, it showed me the equation, showed me what to do. But I guess, Lars, what's even more striking is what you said a few minutes ago, is that you fed a graph back into ChatGPT, exactly. and it could see that the, the the model was explosive, that something was wrong, and was able to yeah, figure it out. And I literally just said, okay, I just you know cut part of my screen out that it, that just came out as as Python output, and just plugged it directly in to the prompt and said, you know, what's wrong? And it says. The parameters seem to be wrong. You know, let's adjust them. And it got me a new Python code and and eventually it worked. Yeah, so it's it's really fascinating. It's not just a simple old-fashioned Google lookup. It's literally thinking through some of these problems with you. And that's just that's mind-blowing. It's it's really something. And I want to use that as a transition to a related question, and that is what does this mean? for the profession of economics, and I think in particular for people going to get a PhD in economics, what do you see as the implications both for the jobs available and what skills should they be developing in their PhD program? Well, thinking, you know, because I I, I strongly believe that artificial intelligence has nothing to do with intelligence. It's very advanced statistics. To me, there is an evolution that is completely natural from traditional econometrics and statistics to, let's say, automated statistics that machine learning is essentially trying out different statistical models and choosing the best thing. That's a kind of wisdom of the crowd statistics that that machine learning is. Uh, At least that's how economists easily can understand machine learning rather than how data scientists understand it. Large language models is in follows naturally from that. So it's, it's natural to work with, but, you know, The analysis is only as good as you are as an economist, as a thinker. We have read hundreds and, you know, probably both of our thousands of papers on economics through the years, where we'll see from the beginning that this is garbage in, garbage out. That, you know, they've done all the econometrics and now claim to have figured out how the world works. 
yeah, that's just a lot of stuff you put in. One of the problems, if you ask ChatGPT to tell you who Lars Christensen, the economist, is, or who the economist David Beckworth is, ChatGPT knows both of us and, and will give us, you know, a, a surprisingly good description of both of us. But if you then start to ask about what we think about nominal GDP targeting, it's like, oh, yeah, uh, these guys favor nominal GDP targeting. And then when you start to ask further questions, you would see that then ventures into some kind of, I hate the term, mainstream economics. Because what large language models are is essentially just a fitted model. It's just an average or median of views that, you know, so if you, if you use it just to ask open questions, you get, you get rather boring middle of the road answers that seems like something you could read in, in, in the financial times of the wall street journal from a middle of the road, wall street economist or, 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 you know, world bank economist, you don't get proper economic analysis. So to me, this is a fantastic tool to help you think. You know, the picture I use of this, the analogy of the use of that is Iron Man, you know, Stark Industries. This is Stark Industry Economics. You are inside of Iron Man, but you are the economist. So you can do things faster. You can fly. You can shoot. You know, you have this armor. But it's still you. You are the guy thinking. AI does not have a will. It is not creative. So to me, as you know, somewhat hyper guy, you know, who likes to produce stuff, who likes to write stuff, I just like, my God, you know, the new version of ChatGPT, you can take out your phone, you can speak to it. And, you know, yesterday I wrote a, a, a post on LinkedIn where I was like, okay, I, you know, I th thought, okay, I can use ChatGPT on my phone as an intelligent dictaphone. So I wanted to write that. And I started to say, you should write something kind of like blah, 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 do write this and this. And I said, yeah, but, you know, but I need to go to the shower. So you need to continue writing a little bit more. And then it was continuing. And then it went back actually to my DSG article. And so it had memory of what I had been inputting into it. And so out came this piece where I was thinking, I dictated this. But ChatGPT was helping me. You know, the flow of word was that. But it was certainly me. It was not something artificial. It was me, but it has just sped up, you know, the, how fast I could do this. And so that, you know, in terms of how we want to educate young, new economists, you know, I was never, I was never fascinated by the purely technical side of econometrics. To me, econometrics is a tool that we can use to demonstrate things. The same with DHG models. You know, the the reason we use math in economics is to ensure logic. That, you know, I wrote my master thesis on on Austrian business cycle theory and got very disillusioned by that because I what I tried to do was to formulate Austrian business cycle theory mathematically. And it couldn't be done. It couldn't be done because Austrian business cycle theory is not logically consistent. And so it showed that. But I'm not fascinated by the math itself. It's just a helpful tool. So in the same way as Python is just a helpful tool if you want to do econometrics. But why should I sit and code when I can just say, I need a Phillips curve or a equation of exchange or uncovered parity, interest rate parity, or you know, maybe you should build in this in this direction. Yesterday, I had been in Sweden doing a presentation. And on the way back, I was reading a newspaper article. And I thought, this was silly. This is a silly article, Danish newspaper article. I thought, the problem here is that, you know, they don't think consistently logically. So I asked ChatGPT on the, on the go, on my phone, to create a small microeconomic model with two sectors in the economy a uh, fixed stock of capital and a shock out to the price in one of the sectors. And it put it out. And then I said to it, take this model 
and take this silly article and write a rebuttal of the article based on the model. And out came the text. And it was like, obviously, it was not just copy-paste. What is it me as an economist thinking? Yes, it was. It was me. Right? But, you know, I was sitting doing it on my phone. I didn't need to get out the laptop. I didn't need to do any any coding. I was just doing it on the go. So there's still the principle of comparative advantage. We will always have something unique and original to offer. And if anything, this may serve as a way to make you more productive, right? You have the ideas, you have, this is what I want to do, but I I don't need to spend my time working up the code or or plugging in these equations. They'll do it for me. That's a great story. So you you fed it the article, you fed it your ideas for responding, and boom, it pops out. So I, I guess going forward then, what it might mean for the profession is higher expectations. You, you know, it just if you, if you oh, look yeah. back historically, like few people could at first use computers. It was expensive, time consuming, but as time goes on, statistical models get more complicated. And then, you know, DSGE models become more accessible because of computing power. Now we're at Hank models are very complicated. But th- this tool is just going to make it easy for everyone to do that. Therefore, if you at a minimum will have to do the more complicated models in your research, but it'll be easier for you. Yeah, but I think that there's an interesting thing here in, in this is that while you're working with these, I think I, myself is an illustration of this, is that I'm working as an economist where it's getting this boost to productivity and I'm observing this, commenting on what that thing is doing to the world while at the same time being dragged into that world. And, you know, from somebody who's been looking on the world for 30 years and not participating, you could say, that's not entirely true because, of course, been on you know, running my own business for nearly 10 years, been a banker and so forth. So I've been very much part of the economy. But, but you know, suddenly it's it's on a micro level. It's not just investment decisions. It's it's suddenly discussioning, you know, could the price of milk really instantaneously change when the Fed announces its rate decisions? So my argument has been that, you know, that also means in terms of our abilities as economists, where we are in the job market is changing because, you know, if you go back, I love sports analytics. I'm a great fan of, of Michael Lewis's uh, book, Moneyball. And if you look at the story of the Oakland A's in the early 2000s, they were essentially doing value investing. You know, they, they went out and said, you know, what kind of baseball players are overestimated, uh, overvalued, and which ones are uh, who are undervalued? You know, it's and it described, you know, Michael Lewis describes it perfectly well. But Michael Lewis should write Moneyball 2, how money disappeared or how mispricing disappeared. Because the interesting thing is that if you look at what happened to the pricing of baseball players in the years following the Moneyball book, Paul Popodesta was moved from, from the Oakland A's to Red Sox. This seems odd that they ain't talking about baseball, which I have no clue about, but I know that story. And I know the story about the pricing of baseball players, that the inefficiencies disappears once they were discovered. So that is happening more and more. And if you look at at the quants in the banks and then in the financial markets, the quants came in in during the 90s and into the 2000s. If you look at the banks today, there are actually fewer quants many places. Why? Because markets are efficient. You know, the quants can't contribute there. And my point is, Tomorrow, the quants are moving into Costco. You know, the price of milk in Costco will be determined by an algorithm within the next five years. Yeah, call me. I will help you. Oh, I know somebody who will. So, you know, that's where we are moving. So the economist and the skill set of economists will, will move from government and finance to the broader economy. And I think, I think that, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm totally excited about it. Well, that is a perfect segue to the next area that I want to touch on with you, and it relates to AI. And what does this all mean for the Federal Reserve? And I want to go two directions with that. First, what you just touched on, the transition of economists from, say, government sector to the private sector. So what will the Fed look like? If we have all this big data, we have AI, will we need a Federal Reserve as big and with as much labor-intensive work as it's currently doing? That's my first question. And then secondly... Time permitting, I'd like to get into a brief discussion on 
how the Fed could handle the productivity effects of rapid AI growth, rapid productivity growth that falls out of that. But let's go to the first one. So the Federal Reserve is the largest employer of PhD economists. It's an important demand engine for people coming out of the pipeline. Getting a PhD in economics has been a very wise investment for many years, in part because the Federal Reserve is there, but also there's lots of jobs in industry as well for PhDs in economics. But what do you think this this means? And and I, I bring this up because you know Milton Friedman many years ago talked about a, a computer doing an algorithm, and, and that of course algorithm is very simple. Just keep money growing at a constant pace. But you could imagine an algorithm, even if it followed like a Taylor rule, it could it could it could mine the data, it could look for changing parameter relationships, it could do all of that in a second, which now may take you know economists a lot longer to do. So so what are your thoughts? in terms of where this all lands? I think Milton Friedman was right. I think we were right. And I think because we were right, the market monitor is that market reflects all available information. The Fed should just, you know, leave it to the markets to decide on monetary policy. Since machine learning and AI is widely used in the financial sector and soon will be used by supermarket chains around the world, well, there is no need for the Fed to use these algorithms because the market is still will still encapsulate all that. That being said, obviously, we will get much better macroeconomic indicators because of this. We can we can find new patterns, and there is no doubt in my view that machine learning is a tool that has been underutilized by economists in general. We have stuck to the old econometrics. And probably be, I among my, myself has been very, very skeptical about machine learning because machine learning often is a block, black box. It, it, it's good at, at providing predictions, but it's not very good at telling you why certain things are. And, and as economists, we want to know why. But you can ask yourself, if you conduct monetary policy, do you want to know why? Yeah, if if inflation is going up and that is what you are you are targeting, you want to know why because otherwise you confuse supply and demand shocks. If you're targeting nominal GDP, it's less important to know why. So essentially, markets are already reflecting the development in technology in terms of information technology, in terms of large language models, in terms of of machine learning. So in that sense, you could say the Fed doesn't need all these employees. You know, I have many friends working in the Fed system, and you know, I have the greatest respect for Fed economists, and and it's it's a it's a wonderful place, all of the districts to work undoubtedly, and and uh, and there have come some very good economists out of that. But if you want to have an institution that educates economists, that's fine. I you know, I'm I'm not going to argue with that. But you can also say that one of the things that the Fed system, you know. There's always been discussions about leaks from within the Fed system because there's so many economists involved in every FOMC decision. And I have kind of had the view that that's good. You know, the, you know, we're having that inside information is gradually spreading into the economy. So there will be less shocks because markets will actually tend to adjust faster to the real thinking of, of that. And obviously, if you are, if you have a lot of people talking, writing analysis, I'm sure that if you if you took all working papers being produced by the Fed, ran them through large language models, you would be able to track the sentiment of FOMC members better than just looking at macroeconomic data. But back to my question about the Federal Reserve. Will the Federal Reserve in the future, be much less labor intensive in terms of Fed staff. As I mentioned earlier, they're the biggest employer of of economists. And, and in my mind, I can imagine a world where that changes quite a bit. They still have the FOMC. There's still people at the top. Someone has to take the blame if something bad does happen or be responsible for decisions being made, good and bad, but maybe far less need for, for staff economists. I guess, where do you land on that? Imagine that I'm right on dynamic pricing. Then we're moving towards a world where monetary policy essentially becomes less harmful, even when it's harmful. The cost of monetary policy failure is mostly a result of sticky prices. 
when I read, read Fisher Black, you know, he was this complete out of the box financial theorist who suddenly decided to do macroeconomic models. I don't know if you know, are familiar with his macroeconomic models. And, you know, from reading the first time, I was like intrigued by what is this? This is really, really weird. And he said, you know, monetary policy is just endogenous. And, and you know, I'm this Friedmanite, you know, thinking about the money supply. And now I'm th increasingly thinking that Fisher Black was right, not for the time he was writing about, but from the time we are moving towards. Not that monetary policy is endogenous as such, but just that we're living in this world that resembles the world of Eugene Farmer. It's not stock prices and bond prices, but it's the price of milk. And so when you are in that world, monetary policy becomes less harmful. You know, I'm sure that the Fed will 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 mess up again. But it's it's it the cost of messing up when prices are much less sticky than they were in the 70s, and there's a lot less inefficiencies, is lower. So that in itself would be an argument. You wouldn't need a lot of people to our, our mutual friend George Selgin would say that, you know, the reason there are so many people working at the Fed is to clean up after itself, after its own mistakes. And so if if the Fed's ability to make mistakes is reduced by technology, then that maybe removes the argument for the Fed. But again, Milton Friedman would say there is nothing as permanent as a temporary government program, and, and the Fed is such a thing. So you're saying that central banking in general will become less consequential because a world of dynamic pricing, flexible prices, shocks will just have less of an effect. It's a reluctant view I have. It's, it's really a reluctant view I have. But I, at the same time, imagine the past 30 years, since the mid-90s, we moved into the great moderation. Then we had 2008, and it was it was this huge shock and this massive monetary policy mistake. And then you had the lockdowns of 2008, and I, in some ways, look at look at inflation expectations in the market. You know, I think there was something that profoundly important that happened in 1997 when uh, Robert Hetzel wrote his piece on Wall Street Journal about tips about inflation-linked bonds. And that gave us a market for inflation expectations. And even though the Fed has never officially targeted that, it became something that everybody could see. And it has had this tremendous impact in terms of creating nominal stability. And, you know, had we not had something like that, and had the Fed not taken the actions it did in, in 2008, even though it had failed dramatically, it would have been much, much worse. We would have been in a, in, in a 1930s situation. And despite of that massive lockdowns, and I, I believe a significant monetary policy failure on the easy side in 2021, not in 2020, but in 2021, you know, we, we returned relatively fast. And I believe that is because markets have become a lot less sticky. Prices have become less sticky and salaries have become much less sticky. Lars, in the time we have left, I want to come to the last question that we touched on earlier, and that is how will monetary policy deal with rapid productivity gains in a world you know, where AI has taken over and all these rapid you know, opportunities are there? And, and in particular, how do we allow the real gains to be shared widely? How does everyone get to you know, participate and ride the, the the wave of AI. And I'm going to bring up a solution suggested by George Selgin, and I'm going to run it by you and see what you think. So George Selgin has a book called Less Than Zero, and I think it'd be very fitting for this time. Again, should the productivity surge be permanent? Should AI really deliver all that we are hoping that it will? And he says this, assuming the productivity shock is economy-wide, so it's, it's felt by everyone, or most industries, and assuming there's some competitive measures, the best way to share those real gains is through mild, gentle deflation. And he distinguishes that between something like the 1930s, which is the collapse in demand. He would argue if you keep demand stable, and, and maybe we still have sticky nominal wages, but you keep like nominal wage growth stable, you could still have output prices fall due to this productivity gains because per unit cost of production will go down. So if 
you know, if, if we're paying someone a, a wage at a firm and we have, again, a long-term labor contract, which may not happen in this future world, but just for the sake of the example, let's play along, sticky wage, but the cost of production per unit is falling because of these productivity gains, you could still see output prices fall. And if competition is there, firms compete. And so the real gains would be shared widely via lower, not radically lower, but lower prices that maybe just a small percent every year, but over time would accumulate. And and that's his vision for how you could do that. And I think that could be applied today. Now, some might say, well, that sounds wonderful, but has that ever happened? And I would argue the postbellum deflation period is one example, not a perfect example, but there are periods there where that seems to have been the case. What are your thoughts? Do you think Selgin's solution would be something we could apply in such a world, or is it more complicated than that? It, first of all, I'll say it's it's a, it's a wonderful book. It's a fast read. It's isn't uh, two hundred pages, it's, but it's 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 a it's a wonderful wonderful book and it it's it has had a had a great influence on my own thinking about monetary policy and and it's one of the things that led me to favor a nominal gdp targeting because essentially this is nominal gdp targeting where you are targeting nominal gdp growth at the same rate of your perception of real gdp growth you know more or less that would bring you to that world if i think it would be rather dangerous to announce it be going from one to another because the problem is that our debt is not real, it's nominal. So debt ratios would go up in a world of mild deflation. That being said, imagine we had 3% or 4% nominal GDP growth, but you had accelerated real GDP growth due to a productivity shock or, you know, boost to productivity. Let's say U.S., for the sake of the argument, U.S. trend growth, real trend growth is 3.5%. You know, that's 1990s. And we had 4% nominal GDP growth. You know, then we will end up having half a percent inflation. Would that be disaster? Not at all, because we'll still be able to service our debt because we had 4% nominal GDP growth. It wouldn't be a problem. And so I, I think that would be my preferred solution. What I would argue, however, is there's other part of this that is important. It's not what we are targeting only, but also how we conduct monetary policy, what instruments we are making. And, and, and the blog post we talked about, my idea was to analyze what, what happens if the central bank's perception of the natural interest rate, or the you know, equi- equilibrium interest rate, is lower than the actual natural interest rates, if it takes time to adjust. If I'm indeed right that AI will boost productivity growth significantly, and the other factors I mentioned, anti-obesity medicine, demographics, and so forth, will will help U.S. productivity growth. If the Fed is slow to realize that, then the natural interest rate will, will increase while the Fed will maintain nominal interest rates the policy rate at the same time, the only way they can do that is essentially by printing more money. So you have a deflationary impact of higher productivity, but at the same time, you're having an inflationary impact of easier monetary policy. In that scenario, you would the Fed, if they were focusing on inflation and using the interest rate, they would say, oh, we kept the interest rate unchanged, so our monetary conditions haven't changed. Well, Both you and I know that that would be monetary easing because the natural interest rate would be going up and we would be able to see that in rising stock markets, in rising commodity prices, by the way, what is happening now, and accelerating nominal GDP growth. But you wouldn't see the inflation because inflation would be kept down by productivity gain. So and that's exactly why my my DSG model is showing is that in the calibration I have, and, and, you know, take it with a grain of salt, in the calibration I have, Inflation is little impacted by all these things because these two factors evens out each other. But what you see is an acceleration in nominal GDP growth in, in nominal aggregate demand. And you you wrote a, a paper with, with George about this, I think, back in 2000, 2006, where you discussed the, the, you know, what happened during the 90s. That what, what, what happened during the 90s was we're having a positive productivity shock and growth picking up. The Greenspan Fed 
didn't react to that because they're saying, okay, we shouldn't tighten monetary policy because the, the pickup in growth is not driven by demand. It's driven by uh, a positive productivity shock. So rightly, the Fed didn't tighten monetary policy into that. However, later in that cycle, the natural interest rates likely had moved up and they had kept interest rates unchanged and then monetary policy became excessively easy. You could see signs of that at, at least in in U.S. stock market and commodity prices and so forth towards the end of the 90s and early 2000s. That's when we got the, the so-called tech bubble. I'm still not entirely clear in my head what really happened there. I think it's, you know, I'm very cautious when somebody says bubble and, and can't really tell why that happened. But I do think there are some elements of what we are talking about here. And that, of course, ties that 90s thing together. It feels like the 90s to me. We are in the 90s with all the great stuff that happened in the 90s in terms of productivity growth and actually inflation being pretty much under control. But towards the end of that, we probably failed to realize that the natural interest rate had gone up. By the way, that was also a period of, of relatively high immigration into the U.S. All the elements in the U.S. labor market was very different. Uh, the baby, baby boomers were not leaving the labor market as they've been doing over the past 15 years. But there was a general, quite clear that probably productivity growth was going up and that was increasing the natural interest rates. And that led the Fed probably to having too easy monetary policy towards the end of the 90s. And I can imagine that becoming a problem one, two years down the road. I don't foresee that as a near-term problem. I think the Fed right now has got it more or less right in calibration of, of monetary policy, not in, in, in the framework. I, I'm still critical about the framework. But to avoid getting that mistake, it would be the right thing to switch, in my view, to 4% nominal GDP growth target. and that, that would it wouldn't fix it, but it, that would be better. And then also communicated in terms of market expectations on rates or whatever the, the tool is, rather than in the absolute level of interest rates. Okay. With that, our time is up. Our guest today has been Lars Christensen. Lars, thank you so much for coming on the program. It has been a pleasure. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. Dive deeper into our research at mercatus.org forward slash monetary policy. You can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. If you like this podcast, please consider giving us a rating and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the show. Find me on Twitter at David Beckworth and follow the show at macro underscore musings. <laughs>